the manifesto is designed to say that if we really are in that agile organism rather than the machine, then all of our transformation must be centered on the individual self so that transformation is people centric and it must be sustainable. And I don't mean this environmentally, well, it must. I mean, it must be sustainable as in this is the job. So if we're just doing a big push for six months, well, guess what? We're going to have another big push and a big push and we're going to break. Welcome to another episode of the People Hum interview series. I'm your host, Anushka Rajesh from the People Hum team. Before we begin, just a quick introduction of People Hum. People Hum is an end to end, one view integrated human capital management automation platform, the winner of the 2019 Global Cody Award for FCM, that is specifically built for crafted employee experiences and the future of work. We run the People Hum blog and video channel, which receives upwards of 200,000 visitors a year and publish around two interviews with well known names globally every month. And now for our guest. Jim Lawless is the CEO of Symmetry International and a member of the Forbes Coaching Council. He's also a well-renowned keynote speaker, author, and a consultant on change in team management. Jim is ranked number one outside of the US and number six globally in the current Global Gurus Motivational Speaker rankings. He has addressed well over half a million people in five continents. We are extremely happy and honored to have someone of his stature on our interview series today. Welcome, Jim. We're thrilled to have you. Thank you, Anishka. What a beautiful introduction. Very kind. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be with you. It's absolutely our pleasure. Thank you for making the time to talk to us today, Jim. Pleasure. The first question I have for you was, can you, you know, just enlighten us a little bit and tell us about the amazing journey that you, you've had and what has really brought you to Symmetry International where you are today? Oh, thank you. Uh, so, uh, my journey, well, let's start with, um, with symmetry. The, the idea in creating symmetry, the, even in the name of symmetry, was that for 20 years now, I've worked in change. And what I've generally found is I'll be invited by the leaders to go in and help the people become more accountable, more uh, dynamic, take more risks, be more courageous, engage and get things done because they need the people to do that in the, the ideas economy where it's all about the people. Uh, uh, and then when you've worked with the people, they will say, well, that's, this is all great. We love this and we would do this, but you don't understand. You haven't met my leaders, right? So, so we have a problem. And then, or, or we might get brought in by, uh, by the HR or change community to work with the leaders, but they've got people who haven't got Got the skills to move and perhaps we'll return to that these skills of transformation how we how we actually um process change and deal with the emotions of change and the and the conflict and challenges it brings so the idea behind symmetry was to was to make sure that all transformation is symmetrical that we're we're, we're working with the leadership and the infrastructure uh, and we're also working with the individuals because if we think of um business now as being uh less machine with a, a pyramid and a bosses at the top pulling levers and a big bureaucracy that makes stuff happen that very old school military uh, old military not even the military anymore but that old school idea that's um i mean that's so slow and clunky i mean it, it's still appropriate in some areas and some industries but very rare now for us in most of the world where we're looking at the uh, organization more as an organism uh, and cells, and if the organism is a cell, as it, the, the business is an organism, then each cell is where the transformation happens. So we need that DNA in the individual cells. So symmetry was born to provide both the leadership and uh, infrastructure to enable transformation and agility, because transformation we used to think of as a change program, A to, a to B, right? six months, oh, we've got change for six months, then it'll be done. Well, now it's never done, so it's, it's, it's a new professional skill, uh, but we're not yet treating it as a new professional skill. So how do we help the organization do that through its leaders and infrastructure, and then through its people? And that was the symmetry journey. What's always been important to me is that we see the individual in the workplace uh, as, a, as a human being, uh, which, which sounds obvious, but we tend not to. Uh, and that humanity uh, means that people, all humans, have an amazing ability to have purpose, 
to want to do great things, to to make a contribution. Uh, I, I've got to, actually I can I can share this, uh, a little just quick illustration of it. We've got this huge ability to have this this purpose, this goals and contribution, legacy, live our lives, do things, get things done. Uh, but we also have this massive um, process. This we we share this with a crocodile or a, or a house fly. We 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 have this process which protects us from danger, what we perceive through our education uh, as being danger. And so we'll, we'll, we've got this desire to move forward and, a, and something holding us back. And we'll call this the comfort zone. We get to the edge of the comfort zone. So how can we help people overcome? And that's been my, my work. That's what my book, Taming Tigers, was about. That's what the first uh, probably 15 years of my work in change was all around. And, and, and still is central. How do we um, assist people with this? And so to finish your, your question about the process that brings me to symmetry uh, I, I began my career as a corporate lawyer doing mergers and acquisitions work a long time ago uh, and then I moved out of that world into this world um, just at the beginning of the noughties around about 2001 too and what was very important to me was that I didn't just show up with um, the models from Harvard or Stanford or or, um, or or the coaching models uh, that I or had also yes had all of that and plus my years of experience in in the workplace but also um, that I had experienced this myself so I chose to take on a client challenge to become a jockey within twelve months of sitting on a racehorse which had to be done at the same time as my day job. You know, we'll have to um, transform whilst we perform. We rarely get the privilege of have a year off and transform, right? That doesn't happen. So it was important that the two were juggled. Um, and so I, I had that experience, which was just a very large radical change that I didn't think I could do that took me to the edge of the comfort zone and beyond and beyond and beyond, required me to collaborate and think differently and introduce new habits and rearrange my workload. All the things that we have to do as individual cells to deliver the transformation and be agile and adapt. Uh, but um, uh, then I thought, well, we'll take that on to the next level. And I took the British free diving record. So I became the first British person to free dive down beneath 100 meters under the ocean as diving without a tank. Um, and that was a wonderful voyage outside of the comfort zone. And, 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 and it really is. It, it, the, the connection at first might seem far away, but it's so close because the whole job of the freediver is not to allow this to happen, that, that the process to take over the non-conscious biochemical changes, the changes in our neurology, in our, in our um, hormonal systems, endocrinological changes, but to not allow that to happen, to be very consciously keeping control of my executive function in a place of great mindfulness so that I can have this wonderful experience, which it is, uh, if you do this, um, if you go here at 100 metres all on your own in this very suddenly hostile environment then it's not so good so it was a very interesting experiment on how the human system uh, survives moving far outside of the comfort zone um, there are many other chapters in the story and many wonderful people who supported me and, and many great organizations who taught me as much as as i hope i've given them so there's a there's a longer bigger story with many other characters but i'll i'll end there for now that's great. That's one roller coaster journey you've had. And congratulations on the success of your book. That was very kind. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, and I really like how you um, blended, you know, psychology of the employees with the whole concept that you're trying to bring out that really came out very well. Thank you for that. Oh, that's a great pleasure. I'm glad it came through. Yeah. So, um, Jim, you know um, the phrase, we all learn to perform while we transform. So, yes. in your opinion, you know, why is transformation such a key concept to, you know, just performance in general? Well, I think they're a key concept to each other, aren't they? But, but to take it your way around uh, uh, and, a, and a good way around, um, why is transforming so important to performing? Anybody with any interest in performance is dynamic. They, they are moving. They are not static. So if you have an interest in performance and wish to maintain a level of performance in a world which is moving quite rapidly, then there is an element in which that transformation becomes key. I think on a human level, there is also a point where um, the ability to be uh, humble and vulnerable and look around and say, what don't I know? how could I be doing this 
better, who is doing it better, what can I learn, um, becomes key. So, uh, and that's vital for me. My world moves just as fast as everybody else who may be watching uh, is in their world, both from technology to science to uh, the normal way we do things to whether we're working in an office or remotely. It's constantly changing down to pricing models. So it's all changing very quick. Uh, and so that, that being able to um, perform requires us to transform. To be able to perform also requires a more subtle thing. So from the transformation, we reach the end of the comfort zone. It, it is where we grow. Uh, and we don't grow in our normal um, environment. There, there's Recently, I, I wanted to push this again with a, um, a childhood dream that I had had, um, which was to fly helicopters. And there's... Um, that in the in the personal transformation to perform of aviation, there's a moment which some people watching will have experienced where if they're lucky enough to have tried it, which is where you have to go solo for the first time. And um, whilst you're taking off and doing all your checks and speaking to the, the tower, this is all fine, I, th I found. Uh, but um, once you've taken off and you're up in the sky on your own in a machine, then the brain starts to starts to work. Now, you you the, the, and there's a phrase that uh, this is for my gender. It's for any person, but for my gender, you you go up a boy, and you come back a man. And there is some truth in that, even if you're 60 when you do it, because you you change, you do transform, in order to perform uh, at that new higher level by leaving the comfort zone, by going to those new places, we alter ourselves, and by remaining within it. We remain the same, which is really why, and I believe in that so strongly, on a human level, beyond business, on an ability to grow, to contribute, to parent and to role model, that, that's that been the last 20 years of my work and to return to it, fundamentally why I decided so often, but only in occasions that I speak about at work, um, the free dive, the, the racing, to leave the comfort zone myself in order to bring those stories and experiences back, to truly understand the psychological models uh, and the, neuro, the neuroscience of what it is that we're doing. And the emotions, this is very emotional. And we, we grow in our ability to handle ourselves, to regulate our emotions, which is key to then how we transform at work or how we have conflict at work, which will always come if we're, if we're going to move forward and be creative. There will always be a level of tensions and conflicts. If there aren't, then we just go home and complain to our families, drinking wine or beer about how terrible the boss is. Right? But, but we can't do that in the world that we live in now. We have to engage. And that requires, again, an emotional awareness and regulation. So that, the, the link between transformation and performance becomes absolutely key. And very finally, to put it the other way around, we, Gartner have a phrase I heard uh, around uh, two years ago now at uh, an event that I closed for them, which was we ha must have bimodal thinking. And what they meant was we have two channels, two modes with which we are thinking at work. Mode one, how do I deliver this month for this quarter? Because whatever role we're in, we've got a deadline for this month. We've got a deadline for this quarter. But the other mode is how do I deliver what I need to be delivering in a year's time? It could be a year is even too far at the moment. We have to be looking at nine months, six months. It's everything's been brought forward as far as we can see. We're, we're, we're maneuvering through fog. But we do know certain things are going to be required for that six month, one year hence uh, into the future. So my two modes of thinking, one, what am I doing today to hit the month? Two, what am I doing today to hit the year? Because I know I'm going to have to, what skill do I need? What do I need to understand about machine learning? What do I need to understand about people have algorithms that could support me in, in, in what we're doing with our people. And, and how do I do that? And the one thing that we do know we're going to have to be able to transform uh, in order to perform at in the future is, um, is our ability to adapt and be agile. And, and that's um, what Symmetry is here to support people to do that. It's a skill set uh, and both leading it and being able to manage and deliver the emotional reality of it uh, for the individual to recognize that leaving the comfort zone is positive. It doesn't mean that you have made me feel bad. I am feeling what I would naturally feel if I want to be agile and move. And I have to learn how to regulate that and communicate with you about my needs. It's different, um, but we can do it. That's amazing. I couldn't agree with you on, uh, on the part where, you know, you said um, 
we need to really come out of our comfort zones and we need to you know be willing to take the risk and be willing to try new stuff only to manage change and transform in a healthy proper way that's great i couldn't agree more thank you for that really great. enlightening explanation yeah i'm delighted you found it so good thank you uh, so jim you know and what do you think other is the role of you know organizational culture now in achieving organizational goals how can culture also be tied to organizational objectives this is a big question so firstly i think we need to decide what mean what we mean by culture because this has been a buzz um word uh as well as a very important business tool and concept a buzz word uh for maybe a decade plus so i think we could take many definitions let's let's uh, let's settle just for the purposes of the conversation on on um uh, how we do things even when the boss isn't watching or even when nobody's watching so it's really the culture it's not just how i behave when i'm under surveillance or in public it's it's what what i what i choose to do how i choose to conduct it the importance of that primarily and fundamentally is an environment being created where people are supported to do the right thing and know that it is safe to do the right thing whatever that right thing may be and we have to help define that that becomes a huge leadership task and that's set right the way from the top and I'll I'll, I'll ex- let me I'll, let me use a diagram to help to help explain what I mean so 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 the um this looks very complicated it really isn't uh, and if uh, i'll send you a copy and if anybody wants to contact you for it you can with pleasure send it out but, yeah, but if we're, we're looking at a place where in the culture we want people who can do the right thing right? They, they they know what the right thing is to do and they can do it and they look after each other and they hold themselves accountable to a certain standard of behavior because that's how we do things it's like a, a great sports team we operate to a certain level we look after each other and we even when no one's checking I'm going for a run I'm going for a run right because of why would I not I I need to show up and, and do so this is at the top now not not the not the boss with the levers and the the big parking space at the front of the building this is at the top the people who will interact with this um this organism so so if we're going to help the people be there then we're going to have to need managers who can coach them to be there we're going to need teams that can interact we're going to need a technological platform so these are the easy things that i'm getting i'm going over them quick because they don't go direct and and really to the depth of the question you asked the question you've asked comes right down here so we get a decision making architecture so so let's start at the bottom the, the the real starting place which is what is what are we here to do what's the mission of this organization uh, and who are we these this this is vital in an agile organization because if we're changing who we are every day i can't possibly um operate with certainty at way out here if it's changing way down there right? so we have to know this and then we have to know what's our environmental um position what is our social position what is our governance position our esg the new b corp ideas what's that and what are our values and ethics and then we get up to strategy and then we involve the top team now the top team of course may have done huge amounts of work either alone or in collaboration with on this or with their stakeholders with their investor groups with their private equity backers who knows but there's huge task has gone on here but the top team isn't at the top and the top team isn't at the bottom the top team is facilitating this culture that can only come once we've got all this in place so here's where the symmetry becomes so important because in my world I get invited all oh, help these people take accountability how you don't know what you're doing and and you're all fighting with each other at, at the top team and you've all got your different politics we can't possibly these poor people we can't ask them or uh, it's fix these guys okay or we can do great work here tremendous work here but but it'll never happen until these folk have got a different understanding of how to lead for the team leaders and how to operate for the others the culture then we we've, we've got all distracted with with um just thinking about values and behaviors and i i i don't have the study to hand i think there was a study in a in a in an american prison high security murderers and they got them all together very violent people and asked them what um what values they would like what culture they would like in their area of 
of the prison. And it all came back with trustworthy, integrity, honesty, respect for each other. I mean, it's what humans say they want, right? How we deliver that is very testing. Uh, and around their environment. Am I rewarded for honesty or, or, or do I feed my family better if I play, play a game of cards with everybody? So the culture comes from here and then this decision-making arch architecture. And this is critical to culture, not a poster on the wall. We can't ask these people to do things, take decisions, be in, have integrity, take ownership of a situation and take decisions in the moment, dynamically, in real time to serve the customer or each other if they haven't got any permission. So when we do this work, what we find is everybody, uh, well, it's done well, when we have the leaders in the room as well, what, what we find is at the end of the day, because this work is never classroom based, it's always, how do I, we're, we're always teaching the skills of change by planning what we would need to do to deliver the strategy. Now, what is a really big, gold, bold goal that you would, you would love to own, be accountable for delivering, that delivers the strategy and people love this they get really engaged they get they get they got purpose they've been invited to to, to, to go a step further and they've been challenged and, and it works for us as human beings they love it and then we work on what is the things that would stop you and they list them all down and some of it's themselves some of it's the organization and then we ask them to fix it and what we have is a cue a cue to speak to the senior people in the room and Everybody has one question. May I? Is it okay if? It's just permission. Very rarely does it need budget or training or resources. It's just permission. If I do this, I'd have to ask you to do that. But you wouldn't, would you? Yeah. <gasps> really? And, and suddenly we get these really authentic, engaged conversations because this is all being put in a natural human alignment where it can work. Culture absolutely vital it's not a pretty poster it's not a sales campaign that's in there the communication is vital my decision making architecture what you have permission you know there's a store i don't know if you have it in mumbai called primark it's a fashion retailer um okay so it's a big it's a and it's low cost so everybody can go there um, and um they uh in their stores have the stock decisions, what is held in the store from all their different possibilities, what is put in one store is decided by the store manager. Now they've got access to AI, they've got access to data, they've got access to support, but they decide the same man or woman who does the lunch times for all the staff and turns off the alarm on, on the, in the shop in the morning, decides what's stocked. Now they can do that because they've been given huge amounts of permission, huge amounts of data, critical that this feedback's going to and fro. And then of course, we can now even, even as, as the various different platforms in the organizations become more advanced, we can, we can now understand who feels that they have certainty, who feels that they have permission, who does not feel we can embed those questions into pulse surveys so that we can begin to see what how we're doing in giving permission and we can begin to see which managers are truly working as team coaches and who are still working more as supervisors and we can support them help them change them so that they can move on because we can see the hot spots appear in the data the data becomes important too so we can help grow the culture uh, it's a long answer, but it's a huge topic, and um, uh, and hopefully that's a slightly different perspective on it. Absolutely, it's such a fresh perspective. So, so you're saying the culture needs to be aligned with the employees' goals, and even on a micro level, that will ultimately lead to a macro level enhancement of the organization. Yes, uh, I, I, yes. There's another phrase I'll throw in to, to, to I think is this, we're in the same place, which is that culture has to be contextual. So we've, we've brought up culture as in what would be nice. What would be nice is very important. We want people to be happy and, and, and relaxed. And of course, what is not nice and good is wonderful, but it's not enough. So it needs, and it's not enough for me if I'm going to believe that my job is safe uh, as well. I, I, I have to know we're moving forward. So the culture, when you make the culture contextual, we will be sustainable. We will um, deliver X, Y, and Z to the communities that, that we serve. I don't mean by, by voluntary work. I mean by the product, by the medicine we produce or the doctors that we provide or whatever it may be that we do. Um, that, that we know that in order to do that, we, we can't do it unless we are culturally X, Y, Z. And so sports teams, 
they tend to have strong cultures because they, they have to win and they know what the context is. And so that's why when I say earlier, you know, even when my team mates aren't wa watching, I, I go and keep my, my fitness because I, I've got to show up on the, on the field. We've got to win together. So that culture is contextual. And where I think we've gone wrong is thinking of culture as merely branding or experience. It's part of both. But it has to to be contextual. That means we have to know um, why we're doing it, uh, what our morality is around it, what our strategy is to deliver it, who our, that our top team are aligned in delivering it, and that we have an architecture around within which we can operate and take decisions. That's amazing. I love the examples that you give. It's just so easier to relate with the concept that you're trying to uh, give our audience. So that's great, Jim. Thank you. I'm glad, I'm glad it works for you. Yeah. So um, do you also think, you know, companies can serve as role models for individuals or leaders? And if you do, so how does that take place? How can they actually be role models? Yes, but I'm going to, if it's okay with you, just modify it slightly from a company to a community. So I think a company can, yes, absolutely. But let's not think of that as, you know, the brand Apple. Let's think of that as the men and women who um, uh, globally, including their partners and suppliers and, and all the people who add to that innovation around the world, let's think of that as, as combat and what, what is being achieved by that community and what they're delivering out into wider society, can that be um, inspiring? And the answer to that you know, has to be a resounding yes. And, and again, I mentioned earlier the B Corp, a very new idea, but watching people now aspire to a new level of accreditation, um, which takes into account our, our position on environment, uh, society, and our governance, as well as then taking into account our employee experience, which, which we've, you know, we've looked at that now for a while, an employee brand and, and put that central. Um, we've uh, looked at investors in people in, in the United Kingdom. We have an accreditation called Investors in People, which has been highly, highly prized as a, a big, uh, big achievement that people are delighted to have reached um, because it means they're, they're looking after the well-being and the, the, the future well-being of their people very well. So I think um, we're changing how that inspiration comes across. I, I, I risk going into the mainstream conversation in a way that is not helpful when I say that as the, as the different um, belief systems of younger people coming into the workforce touches the traditional industrial age model of profit for stakeholders and requires stakeholders uh, and the organization because the young people are both consumers and employees and we need both to reconsider their position i think that's that's no and, and the environmental urgency it was not just you know i'm old i'm generation x um but i have two young daughters and they are the center of my universe and so i i i'm not lazy about the environment right may, may, may the consequences for me personally may be um, limited of what happens in 50 years time the consequences for them and, and their children is, is is unbelievable so 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 I think we must remember that all generations are, are human and have a stake but we are seeing a change being driven perhaps we would accept just working for the boss in a way that some people aren't now uh, and so as a result of that there are changes being driven throughout the organization if I were to take one example though which I, I guess is underlining your question there um, there are many that I could take, and some of that were le less well known that I would use uh, in this environment. Um, but, but just for one very quickly, because it's a shorthand, is Netflix. Uh, their devolution of decision making around the world, the local, local content production, extraordinary. Their forward thinking uh, and willingness to, um, uh, in the words of the, 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 the team at Innersight, to have dual transformation, to be looking at uh, how we transform the industry in 10 years and then be delivering that today whilst also delivering our model today our current model so taking those those steps um transforming the market today whilst fundamentally shifting the, the paradigm is extraordinary um, and patty mccord who i is one of my heroes um in, in our in our field who was um uh hr director there in the early days um she's moved on now to um other things the and she's written about this in her book as well but the the um netflix culture deck the original culture deck was totally contextual it's like if we're going to trust people and tell people they're trusted and autonomous and accountable and can make decisions and they're adults and we want them here as contributing adults why do we have to ask them to sign off to get on an airplane to go and talk to somebody why, why would we do this 
and we have an environmental policy around when you can fly that's a separate conversation but but and we we all know especially now that we can zoom but why would we stop somebody taking the decision who we trust as an adult to spend 300 bucks on a flight to go and so the expenses policy as many people now will know became act in netflix best interests boom i just think that was such a i mean why well, I, I was so shocked i've never read anything like that when i first saw it i know a decade ago just extraordinary to read that i like wow how could anybody say that it really challenged my thinking so there are areas of this culture that, that must be contextual and where we can admire what communities have done to shape themselves as communities uh, and, and and huge work there's a case study available on um my website, Symmetry International, uh, of the work we did with, uh, we, we had a small part, the leader um, of Northern Rock. Now, Northern Rock was a bank which um, uh, has since been bought and renamed. But in 2007, there was a run on the bank in the crisis, and it, it was insolvent. And so the British government bailed it out and put their, a new gentleman into run it called Gary Hoffman, who was required to bring it back to profitability and back into private ownership. And this was a huge task, which was delivered. And uh, he, he talks in the case study about the work we did together about how we changed, it was necessary to support him in changing the culture um, uh, and the thinking, where there was a big chain up to the boss with the levers, that chain all the way down. How could we push that out? That took time, it took effort, it took a new vocabulary, it took strong leadership, and it took um, uh, letting a number of people who were unable or unwilling to change letting them move on or requiring them to move on and it was real and it was hard and it was done and i would hold that community up again uh, as a community that did incredible work uh, having been taking a taking a really tough time in the press and having failed very publicly uh, then turning themselves around with new leadership extraordinary so these these inspirations as you rightly say in other companies communities are there absolutely that that's really great I, I i love how you're properly explaining with the diagram and i think our audience is really going to benefit from all the illustrations uh and we really appreciate it thank you so much jim so um just to kind of wrap this interview up do you have any last sound bites that you'd like to leave our audience with and we just created a, a manifesto and the manifesto is designed to to underpin any kind of change that we're looking at in the 21st century and it's all it's all to help us move from this um this idea of of the machine you know the, the boss and the levers and the bureaucracy and the, uh, and and look at us more as this extraordinary complex agile agile community and the manifesto is designed to say that if we really are in that agile organism rather than the machine, then all of our transformation must be centered on the individual self. So that transformation is people centric and it must be sustainable. And I don't mean this environmentally, well, it must. I mean, it must be sustainable as in this is the job. So if we're just doing a big push for six months, well, guess what? We're going to have another big push and a big push and we're going to break our people. If we keep asking them to leave the comfort zone, we don't teach them how. We're going to break our people. This is a long soundbite. Here's what I would say. We have to have people-centered transformation. And that has to be symmetrical. The leaders have to be involved. And it has to be sustainable. It's the new way of working. It's an agile organization. And here's the last thing I'll say. There is an architecture to that. It's not mysterious. It wasn't mysterious what I said today. There was no clever um, buzzwords required. You know, we understood each other very clearly. We live in families and communities. There is an architecture to how we deliver this. And I, and I tried to show it through, um, through this uh, diagram earlier, which, which I'll, I'll make available to you to pass on. But you know, this, is, this is the outline of the architecture. And in here, there's some complex tasks. But the architecture itself is relatively simple. So we need to be people-centered with our transformation. The cell must have the DNA to transform. We must um, be symmetrical. That means that the organization and the leaders must create the environment where the cell can transform. We have to make that sustainable so that people can do it for the rest of their working lives, day in, day out. It's the normal. And there is an architecture to this. It's not hocus pocus advertising mysterious stuff. It's, it's, uh, it's clear architecture. We can build it. There's art 
but it's also engineering. Yeah, wonderful. That's, that's such an amazing perspective. I'm just blown right now. Um, thank you so much, Jim. I had a wonderful time talking to you. And uh, thanks a lot for, you know, taking the time and sharing your views with us. And personally, you know, it's been such an enriching experience for me. And I think if I can learn so much in 45 minutes, I'm sure our viewers and audience are thoroughly going to benefit from it. Anishka, it's been a huge pleasure. Thank you so much for inviting me. All of my and my team's touches uh, with all of you and your team at People Hum has been just a pleasure. So uh, I'm delighted to play part. Uh, good luck with your mission and thank you very much for uh, a very enjoyable time today. Thank you. Likewise. And uh, we really appreciate even the illustrations that uh, helped us um, learn the concepts that we're talking about better. So thanks a lot for that. And, I'll share those uh, with you and if anybody wants to access them, they can drop you an email. Absolutely, that'd be great. And I really hope our uh, audience will also go and check out uh, Symmetry International. So I, I will Thank surely you. do that after this. So I'm hoping. Everything's, um, everything's available online there. And, uh, and uh, we look forward to seeing you, seeing you there. That'd be interesting. Thank you, Jim. Have a safe and healthy time ahead of you. Hope to con you. be in contact with you. Yeah. Look forward to that. Thank you, Anushka. Good luck to you and the Thank team. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.